You know, so this, uh, this escalated schedule has actually turned out to work actually pretty well. I mean, the first part, for those of you who are not scientists, you may have had a hard time keeping up with the, with the first three or four presentations that we had. Um, and so I'm going to bring the level of abstraction, frankly, down a little bit and really describe what I would label as the state of the science with regard to heat-related illness, specifically in the agricultural sector. And I'm going to use that also as a launching point for introducing the PISCA project and some of the preliminary results that are coming out of it. And for, so for those of you who are more public health people in the, in the room, um, uh, this, this talk will be more for you as, a, as opposed to perhaps the scientists. But let me just get started first and foremost by hitting the right button, by hitting the right button. Trying to hit the right button again. There we go. So this is the Pisca team, and 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 you know one of one of ours is right here in the room. We've got Jeannie from the from the from the Farm Worker Association. We have representation from the Migrant Clinicians Network. That is um, uh, that is Amy Liebman right there. Our team is actually meeting as we speak. Our our, our uh, every two week meeting is going on right now, and. As you would expect, the principal investigator is not there, so they're probably doing a fabulous job. Um, but the rest of the folks that, that are essential to our team are all these field folks who actually do the important work of the project. And, and it's really with those folks in mind that, that I'm eager to, to share with you the, the comments that we have here today. So as we, as we move forward and dang, hit the right button, I clearly am getting carried away with animation. So my overall goal here today is really to try to, you know, again, to illustrate the state of the science with prevention of heat-related illness and agricultural safety and health. Um, and, and, and to do that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to characterize some things that have been alluded to but haven't really been clarified. And so first of all, we're going to start by trying to talk a little bit about, well, who are farm workers? Right? We've talked about agricultural workers. We've talked about um, you know, how things in the ferneries may be different from crop work. But I'm going to do my best to kind of illustrate who are the workers and what do some of the daily lives of these workers look like. Because I think it's important to see what this looks like rather than thinking about it in a very academic, dry kind of way. Then I'm going to move on to a characterization of the state of that literature. Um, and then we're going to move on to some descriptions of the project. So let's, let, let's keep going from there. So first of all, with regard to you know, actually thinking about who are the farm workers, this person is not a farm worker. All right? This is a farmer. Farmers are not farm workers. Um, some concrete um, illustrations of it would be SOC codes. Right? This is a management SOC code. Right? The median earnings is about $31 an hour or $66,000 a year. By contrast, this is a farm worker. Farm workers SOC codes are way down here. I don't remember what the 45 group calls for. If somebody else knows, you can, you can remind me. Their median earnings at best are maybe $10.50 an hour if they work by the hourly rate for an average salary if they work all year long for $22,000 a year. So a fundamental point is, yes, we're in the agricultural sector. A good portion of the work that the center works on is farm workers not to the exclusion of owners, operators, and other peoples in the, in the, in the industry, but when we're talking about heat-related illness, by far the prevalences are coming in in this group of workers, not this group of workers. And it's important to keep that in mind. If we move that forward then to, well, what are some of the different farm workers, there's all sorts of different definitions that are out there. And the, and the folks that I used to work with back at Wake Forest University School of Medicine, we, we always kind of divided up the world in, in this basic way. And that is, well, we've got the migrant workers, and migrant workers are really anybody who moves from point A to point B for purposes of work. Folks like the National Agricultural Workers Survey and the Migrant Ed Program and you know, some of the different other uh, 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 governmental programs, they'll divide it up in yet many different ways. Right? Are there international migrants or are they shuttle migrants? Or, you know, so there's all sorts of different versions of it. But in the end, you know, we, we always sort of broke it down into terms of, well, there's the migrants, those that kind of work, um, and then they move on to another place, whether it be nationally or internationally, or those people who are what we refer to as seasonal workers. That is, they work when there's agricultural work available to them, and then they do something else when agricultural work runs out. So as we, uh, uh, if you want to get some sense of the overall prevalences, you know, enumeration studies are very difficult to come by, and I'm embarrassed to admit Here's your first chance to say, yeah, you pretend to be a scientist, but you're really not. I don't remember where I found this table. 
The numbers themselves are not particularly important, though, because enumerating farm workers is an exceedingly difficult task. Um, folks like Alice Larson has been working on it now for almost 20 years. She's done it for a wide variety of different states. She's got one methodology, but frankly, she's going to be retiring. And right now, she's working to try to pass on that method to a variety of other groups to see to it that that, that important work continues to happen. The single most important thing about this table, again, is not the numbers, but rather the estimates of where are the farm workers. And so clearly California, perhaps because of its climate, does indeed have the largest farm worker population. But of course, Florida, and then by extension, the Atlantic Southeast, is, is clearly the sec has clearly the second largest farm worker population. The corresponding piece, though, that goes along with it is that, of course, you know, I'm in family and child sciences. And so you know, wherever you have a worker, guess what? You've got families that are with them. Now, clearly, again, there's variation around that with regarding the migrants as opposed to the seasonals. There are some families that follow um, uh, the worker and take families with them. They certainly exist. But at least in some of the enclaves that we've been doing work in, that's becoming less and less common um, simply because the older children become, the more likely they are to try to have the family stay put while the worker moves so that children can stay in one school and try to keep up with the educational requirements. So, so, so the overall point here is when we're talking about the farm worker population, it's both the worker as well as the individuals who are dwelling with them, which is oftentimes wives and children. And so as you think about para-occupational exposures, at least with regard to things like pesticides, and of course, the, the, the quality of the housing environments and what that means for heat-related illness, you know, so clearly you can see that it's a, it's a hidden population. So as we take a look at what does the farm worker population look like nationally, these are data from the National Agricultural Workers Survey. I'm currently working with Susan Gabbard and Daniel Carroll on, on summarizing data from 2009 to 16, and I'll be heading out to UC Davis to, to, to present some data from, from the workers. But this gives you a pretty clear sense of who are farm workers. Um, this doesn't include the H-2A workers, which we're seeing a substantial uptick, especially here in the Atlantic Southeast, given, given some of the immigration issues that are at play um, uh, 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 at the federal level. Um, uh, so, so, so H-2A workers are not included in this enumeration. But on average, farm workers are somewhere around 37 years old, right? You can see the confidence interval that's there over the course of the last seven years. About 28% of farm workers are female, highly gender segregated, as, as Joan was saying with very different activities frequently being reported by women and men. Um, the vast majority are, are Latino, most of which are from Mexico, and most have a pretty low level of education. And this low level of education is an important element that's going to come in a little bit later on in my presentation. So that gives you a little bit of sense about who are the farm workers. Let's take a look at the daily life, and I'm hoping this is going to work. Is there internet access in here? I should have asked. If I click on this, is it going to let, is it going to, can you click on any one of those? Click on the watermelon one. Let's do that one first. So this, watermelon harvesting, oh, nuts, is it taking us anywhere? Okay. So I, 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 again, I'm, I, I want to, the goal here, and I obviously plan poorly, so that's my fault. You can throw, throw fruit at me, all you UF folks in the back who are, you know, like henchmen sitting in the back. Um, the, the goal here is really being able to see, well, what does farm work really look like? Um, and, and what you'll see here, if we can get the technology to work, is some very concrete manifestations of watermelon harvest, which takes place up in the northeastern part of Florida. If we can get it to work, you'll get a sense of, well, what does the orange harvest look like? How do these guys and gals actually go about collecting these things that we pick up in Publix or, whole, or, or wherever it is we do our shopping? How do they actually arrive there? And then likewise with tomatoes, which happens substantially in the north. Are we going to be able to get this? And in the meantime, I could sing for you, if you'd like. But I'm not going to do that, because my wife tells me it would be highly inappropriate. Um, the, the, uh, the videos that, that will be coming, though, is you know, one of the things to bear in mind is, is some of the intra-individual variability that was talked about, at least with regard to um, uh, 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 susceptibility and vulnerability um, um, uh, related to heat-related illness, is also inherent in the task. Um, and what some people refer to as the organization of work. 
The organization of work is a concept that NIOSH and the National Occupational Research Agenda has outlined now for almost 20 years, but the idea is essentially how is the work done? How is it created and structured? And one important element of that structure is the compensation system. So we heard Linda talk earlier about the piece rate compensation system for, um, uh, for fernery workers. Many of the individuals working in the tomato harvest, they work by the bucket. Right? So the idea is when your wage uh, depends on how many buckets you fill up, well, you're going to want to work much faster at a much more rapid rate, and you're going to want to try to avoid um, uh, taking breaks. Um, here we go. Perfect. So here will be the watermelon. And we'll just do one just to give you a sense of it. So I was talking with Tom last night about, so how do you actually characterize this workload, right? You've got maybe a two or three second interval where you're doing something, but then there's a moment where you move on to the next one. So if you're trying to characterize the intensity of the work, how do you go about doing that? And then, of course, you've got all the things that Mira was talking about out in the back. We can't see it, right? But there's a temperature that's out there someplace. There's a humidity level that's out there someplace. There's the idea about whether or not any of these guys went out drinking the night before. There's the idea of whether or not they've eaten um, you know, just before they've come into play. So some of that intra-individual variability is inherent in some of those elements. And we'll stop there. I was hoping to show you more. But if we could just simply bring the presentation back up. Why don't you go ahead and show the others? Okay. We've been given the heads up from the boss, so stop my time because the boss just said we can continue. <laughs> we, we can do that. <laughs> Sorry about that. That's that what you looked away from. That may not work. Too much cute animation, too. Here comes, that's the orange one, where they're harvesting oranges. And for those of you who are more musculoskeletal, how do you like that guy perched on that ladder? Right? So here's the tomato harvest. So as Linda was saying, you know, now, you know, in, you know, part of the design is that the tomatoes are growing up rather than down, so there isn't nearly as much bending. But somewhere in this clip, you're going to see folks running with their bucket to get to the truck to get their chit of paper, um, which is going to speak towards the piece rate bit a little bit. You can hear in the background from the, from the camera, you can hear some of the wind. So apparently this must have been a fall harvest because there is a, there is a, a reasonably good wind coming through as opposed to one of the spring harvests. Um, but you can see the crouching, you can see the foraging through the different leaves to try to bring the table, uh, to bring the, the tomatoes out. And this is just kind of more of the, uh, you know, you can keep playing that one if you want to, but if you want to bring up the orange one, that'll give us some music to also dance to. There we go. So hopefully between these three video clips, although it took much longer than I had hoped to actually show them to you, you get a sense of at least the intensity of the work and the variety of the work. So if nothing else, at least the next time you go shopping and you show up in Publix and you see those oranges sitting there all nice and bright and shiny, or the watermelons that are sitting there on display for you to pick up, you can have some sense of, well, what was the burden, what was the cost to some worker someplace regarding how it got to that particular outlet. So then that gives you a sense of a day in the life, and that's just in the harvesting section, uh, section uh, of, of, of the agricultural um, industry. So moving on to some of the things, you know, my project, the PISCA project, is fundamentally about balancing two different major occupational threats. One is pesticide exposure and the other is heat-related illness. And I'll talk about that design in a little bit, a little bit uh, later. 
This slide is really only intended to illustrate one key point, and it's from data that we collected back when I was in North Carolina. But the whole point of it is here on the basis, there's different kinds of pesticides. And here, each one of these blocks represents a different period in the agricultural season. The main point of this slide is farm workers are not exposed to a pesticide. They're exposed to many pesticides across the entire agricultural season. That's the point of this particular slide. So, so clearly, it's one of the major, major health threats as we think about occupational safety and health in the agricultural workforce is exposure to pesticides. But the other one, which is really the focus of our conversation here today, is, of course, the heat-related illness. And, and the data on this in, agriculture, in the agricultural workforce is really quite slim. You've already seen some of the anecdotal evidence from the newspaper clippings that Linda has put forward. You know, but you know, the, from the CDC, come on, there we go. From the CDC, the whole point that's in this particular their slide, obviously in Spanish, is that farm workers are about 20% or 20 times more likely than other folks in other agricultural sectors um, to experience a heat related fatality. Now, Tom was just telling me last night over beer, so apparently, if you loosen them up, you can get them to talk a little bit more fluidly. But he was telling me that it's even higher in the, in the um, lawn care um, uh, industries, and so we'll be looking forward to seeing what that's like. But the fundamental point here is that heat-related illness is, is, is one of the primary causes of occupational fatality in, in the agricultural workforce. Now, if you're going to ask the question, well, what's the state of the science? Well, here's, here's a literature review. You can't, probably can't see it from the back, but the search term is heat illness and safety or intervention or training and agriculture. Five hits. Now, there's lots of other research like that that's coming out of the Emory Group and, 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 and so on that talks about sort of the science underlying what do we know about heat-related illness as it pertains to the agricultural workforce. But when it comes to actually trying to do something about it in the agricultural workforce, you get five papers in the peer-reviewed literature. Two of them have happened over the course of the last two years from the California Group out at uh, Mark Schenker's shop. Um, and, and of course, all California-based, and the rest is just sort of intermittent, hither and yon. So what is the state of the science in prevention research with, um, uh, with heat-related illness and agriculture? Largely none. That would be the state of the science. Again, from a prevention point of view, not from a basic science point of view. So then that leads us to, so what do we do about it? So the PISCA project, the PISCA project as part of the Southeastern and Coastal Ag Center was designed um, to accomplish uh, three main aims. The first main aim was to develop culturally and contextually appropriate curricula for trying to address the two major, the two major causes of poor occupational health outcomes in the agricultural workforce, that is pesticide exposure and heat-related illness. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the study design, which, of course, I'm biased, but I think is, it's, it's very innovative. But we use an attention placebo control, and I'll talk more about that a little bit later on. But the most important piece in this particular aim is the importance of the culturally and contextual relevance. And I'll show you some ideas of what that means concretely in just a moment. Then we wanted to determine the, the effectiveness of those curricula, right? Because we need to know whether or not it's going to work, right? The, the state of the science should be based on data, not based on conjecture or, or what we think might be working in any one particular area. And then most importantly, as far as the large-term sustainability of it, is let's face it, nobody wants to do outreach work. Thank goodness there are Department of Labor folks that are here representing the important work that they do as far as being able to go out and, and, and protect individuals. But nobody wants to fund that work, to be perfectly honest with you. And so by far, the long-term sustainability of any kind of outreach effort is largely going to be through some sort of a promotora, lay health advisor kind of a strategy. And so the last um, aim of the PISCA project is to do essentially a comparative effectiveness evaluation of well, what happens when we use trained professional educators as opposed to a promotora de salud. Um, each of those is going to unfold over the course of a series of time, uh, over a period of time. But the important piece, and this is the first Next point to the state of the science, as Linda has already said, but I will now make it explicit, the state of the science has to be collaboration among community advocates, community, uh, community members, community advocates who are working on behalf of individuals, academics, and other stakeholders in industry. And so in this particular project, these are the stakeholders that are involved, and I've already mentioned them. 
But that's one of the first elements of the state of the science is if you're going to reach this population, it's not going to happen from a lab. It's not going to happen solely from the advocacy organizations. They're going to reach them, but they may or may not have the science. It's not going to be you know, from the bowels of a university preaching down on high, because most of the time, we don't know what life is like out there in the fields for the most part. Many of you in this room are probably shocked by some of what you saw on those video clips. So the whole point is it takes everybody working together. And so that's one of the first answers to the question about the state of the science. The process that we're going through in the PISCA, uh, in the PISCA, uh, in, the, in the PISCA project is essentially phase one. The first year of the project was going to do the development and, and the beta testing of the prototype. I'm going to show you some results from that here in just a second. Then we're moving into phase two, which is where we are right now. Again, I'll talk more about that, but just to give you some sense of how this is moving back and forth across the five-year time slide or time horizon. So with regard to the original results, you know, the first results from our beta testing, so uh, uh, I, I organized my slides badly. Um, so let me give you a sense of the attention placebo control design. The idea is that whenever you go out and do an intervention, everybody here has probably heard of the classic Hawthorne effect, right? You know, when they went into the Hawthorne Light Company and they started asking questions, and lo and behold, satisfaction improved simply because people were asked about it. So the idea is whenever you do an intervention, especially an educational-based intervention, you have to control for just simply the attention that you're giving to individuals, hence the attention placebo control design. And so we randomly assign individuals to either a heat stress curriculum or a pesticide safety curriculum. They each last approximately 60 minutes. They're all facilitated by the exact same individuals. So it's not an, an, an aspect of the personality, right? One person is really engaging. The other person is not particularly engaging. The only thing that's fundamentally different is the content that's being delivered during any given, uh, any given lesson. And so with that background in mind, what you can see from this particular slide is that individuals who are randomized to the pesticide condition, we saw no changes in heat stress related knowledge. What causes it? How do you treat it? How should you, um, you know, what should you do if you start experiencing specific symptoms? But by contrast, individuals who are randomized to the heat stress curriculum, we saw a substantial increase. So knowledge is a good thing. You know, the, for those of us who do behavior, we oftentimes say, well, you got to have the knowledge, you got to have the attitudes, and you have to have some kind of an intention to change the behavior. That's what this slide is representing, is the behavioral intention that follows after the lesson. And so again, those individuals randomized to the um, pesticide group, they show essentially no change in behavioral intention regarding largely drinking water, taking breaks, seeing to it that you're staying well hydrated even after work, whereas there's an increase in behavioral intentions from the individuals who are randomized to the heat stress curriculum. So this was our proof of concept in phase one. In phase two, we then moved our basic prototype into a much more, we're just gonna simply say, professional um, uh, approach at trying to deliver the content. And what I mean by that is, again, academics, we think we know a lot, we do know a lot, but it's oftentimes in a really very narrow space. We oftentimes need people like Ricky and other folks like that who tell us how to communicate information to actually say, okay, now how do you take that information and put it into something that's useful? And so one of the elements, this is the color, the cover slide now to our PISCA. Um, we worked with the Migrant Clinician Network and their uh, graphic designers and instructional designers to help pull this whole thing together. And we were emphasizing cultural and contextual relevance. And one of the first things that you'll see in our operationalization of cultural relevance is, what's the face of the individual that we're trying to speak to? Right? So if you look at the classic EPA um, uh, training materials, it's either a caricature of a Latino or it's a white guy who is driving on a tractor in the middle of Iowa that has relatively little relevance to folks down here in the South. So, so this is one example of what I mean by cultural relevance. Another example of cultural relevance is sort of this idea of, yes, there is substantial inter-individual variability, but when farm workers as a whole are, tw uh, are 20 times more likely to die of a heat-related fatality, we're trying to convey a relatively simple message. That is, everybody's at risk. Everybody needs to be attentive to these particular ideas, regardless of whether you're a man, a woman, you're relatively old, or you're relatively young. Everybody needs to be attentive to this. 
other elements of basic cultural um, relevance is nice, simple ideas. Now, what's missing, I couldn't figure out how to copy and paste it, is a nice, colorful background. Latinos love color, especially bold color. And so what we have in the background here is a dark green color. So it really draws in the, it draws the eye into this idea of, OK, who is this farm worker? What does he look like? Hey. Look, Paul, he's got safety goggles on. You'd like that. Um, and then one core message at a time, all right? And then lastly, we try to keep it simple. What can you do about this? So you, throughout, you'll see bold pictures of here's what you can do. You can drink water on a regular basis, whether that, that water comes from something that the Department of Labor hands out because they're cruising around on the streets handing out ice cold water, or whether it's the crew, off, uh, 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 the crew leaders who are making something that's available, very specific kinds of activities that they can engage in. We also are trying to make it contextually relevant. And here, I'm going to hearken you back to some of the information from the NAS that speaks to, well, the modal education of the folks that we typically interact with is somewhere around sixth to ninth grade Mexican education. So that makes these individuals extremely smart, but they're not accustomed to taking tests. They're not accustomed in thinking in abstract terms. So how do you try to convey this notion that you know, your body can overheat? Well, one way of doing that is through metaphor. Right? Just about every one of them has had a broken down car in some way, shape, or form that's had this particular experience. And so as we start talking to them about, well, you know, in some ways your body is not unlike that car. If you don't put oil in it, if you don't put water in it, it's going to start to seize up and smoke and create some, create some problems. So this is one way that we try to attend to the contextual relevance um, uh, uh, of, of our slides. We try to take on global warming. We don't know anything about it, so we are going to have to talk with Mira soon. But we try to convey this idea of, look, I know you've been doing farm work now for some folks as many as 20 and 30 years, but you know what? It's at least three degrees more hotter now than when you first started doing that work. On top of that, you're older, so therefore you've got some extra elements that just because you could do it 20 years ago doesn't mean you can operate at that same level of intensity today. We try to bring on the idea of, and you know, we, it took us a long time to come up with this notion of trying to explain how does a diuretic work when you don't know what a diuretic is, you know, caffeine and, and, and alcohol and that sort of thing. And finally, we just said, you know what? We just got to let them know, guess what happens when you drink all this stuff? This is what happens out in the field, and all the guys know it, right? They see it. So therefore, they're gonna, they're, we're trying to piece together the idea that when you um, drink these particular um, uh, items, it makes it harder to keep that car from overheating. So here's where my badly placed attention placebo control design is. You know, so it's, 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 when I said I, I organized it badly, I'm putting it here, though. I've already explained the basic design for it, but I'm putting it here because I want to highlight in phase two of the project, we're doing all the same things. Just now we're using our much more stylized curriculum, which includes a fully developed facilitator's guide for those people who want to take it out and be working in Louisiana and other, and other places. But now what we didn't have last time is a 90-day follow-up. So whereas before all we had was knowledge, knowledge and attitudes, here in phase two we're going after behavior. Right? We want to know whether or not we can actually change behavior out in the fields as to whether or not they're drinking more water, whether or not they're taking more breaks, and that sort of thing. And where we are with that, at least as of right now, is summarized in this slide. It's a complex slide, and so I'm just going to say two or three things about it. The first point of complexity is you might be like, well, what's up with this 235-115 thing? Well, the original design called for us to randomize three different um, interventions. One intervention is our pesticide curriculum. One intervention is our heat stress curriculum. But then the other one was the official EPA pesticide curriculum. We got started in our phase two of the project back in February, but guess when EPA finally delivered theirs? Um, they finally delivered it. I think it was in August, Jeannie. Was that right? So the point is, is we got going. And so collectively, we've, we've um, uh, run 235 people through two arms of the intervention, right? Because the, the third one wasn't available yet. But only 115 so far now have been randomized to one of three 
different interventions. So that's why there's this complexity here. You know, you see you know, some of the usual loss to follow up with a highly mobile population. We're getting some really great experiences calling Mexico and trying to track people down you know, to see what they've been doing recently, and that's a whole story onto itself. Um, but here's our farm worker population. They're about 29 years old. This is largely an H2A, right? So 110 out of 31 that we've entered the data on. So we've got data on 235, but we're a little behind on data entry. So, so about a th uh, you know, two thirds of them are H2A workers, and you can see the breakdown that's from there. Right now, we don't have any results, right? This is an intervention. We're not peeking at the data yet to see where it's heading. So I don't know what the, what the outcome of, of it is. But largely, the key point is fundamentally one of, are we changing behavior? And so by this time next year, we'll know the answer to that question. So the overall points that I'd have you take away from this presentation is really these four. First of all, I'm, I'm hoping you now have a clear understanding of who farm workers are and why they're a vulnerable population. Secondly, I'm hoping that you can see part of the reason why this meeting is so important, especially in the ag sector, is it's such an underdeveloped area of science that if we're really going to do prevention work, we've got a lot of legwork to do to try to keep up with, OK, well, what do we do? What is best practice? And some of that best practice is the necessity of cultural and contextually relevant materials to see to it that we're attending to the realities of who the farm worker population is. And then lastly, and perhaps most importantly, the point that I've already raised about the importance of partnerships across multiple sectors. And with that, I'll be happy to take questions. Yeah, Jeannie, you'll know the answer, because you always know the answer. Actually, I just have one comment, um, and it's at the intersection of heat and pesticides. Um, EPA is currently uh, looking at re-registering a class of pesticides in which atrazine is a member, and um, atrazine has got really horrible health and environmental um, implications. But EPA's um, currently, EPA is proposing addressing re-registering atrazine and that whole class of chemicals oh. by telling farm workers to wear more protective clothing. Oh. So this is really a significant issue, and, and everybody in this room can make public comments to EPA and say that, you know, since we're all here looking at heat stress and, and climate change, um, it's really important that people think about making public comments to EPA because more protective clothing to prevent pesticide exposure is only going to put people more at risk for um, heat stress and possibly heat stroke. So I just wanted to make that comment. It's really, really critical, especially now that we know that the temperature is getting higher and it's going to be more impactful. So thanks. Excellent, Jeannie. Thanks for that. Joe, oh, that was great. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about H2A workers and the challenges they present in continuing this work. Um, one of the reasons we're working in Florida is because of the phenomenal resource that the Farm Worker Association provides. Researchers who are trying to do this important work, but in South Georgia we have a lot of H-2A workers. We are totally dependent on the grower allowing us to have access mm -hmm. to these guest workers. And they really don't have the freedom to uh, move around in the com community and access education somewhere else. So first of all, I commend you on being able to access the H-2A, but I would say um, they're in some parts of the country, they're very vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And um, we've also found, as a, as a nurse, I have to tell you, these workers come in without a lot of health screening. Mm -hmm. And so you don't know whether they're hypertensive or not. Mm -hmm. You don't know if they have ever seen a physician or not. Mm -hmm. And um, those are all things that can impact their risk for, for heat-related illness. You're, you're absolutely right about that. And, and, and again, one of the points that, 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 that Linda just brought up, 
again, reinforces the notion of it really takes a village you know, to, to, to pull this off. And the simple fact of the matter is, is you know, we're fortunate enough we're actually situated in southeast Georgia. Um, that's where the vast majority of our work is actually, is actually coming from. And so, and so we do have good entree into the H-2A system. Fortunately and unfortunately, Antonio is not here, but we, uh, he's been contacted by the, the Mexican, whatever the equivalent Department of Labor is, um, and they're interested in potentially using our PISCA curriculum as a pre-training before individuals even come to the United States. So, so that'll be, that would be a nice advancement relative to, to the way things are. But the, the, the vulnerability of the H-2A workers is very, very well made. Um, I had, just as a side note, I had a student who did her um, uh, dissertation on emancipated farm worker youth. And you know, although you're supposed to be 18 to get an H-2A visa, you know, she's, you know, not, with not too much hard looking, she was able to find you know, 20 folks uh, to do in-depth interviews and another 40 folks to do quantitative surveys who all met the criteria of yes, they were without a parent and under the age of 18 through the H-2A system. So, so the point is, is there's lots of levels of vulnerability. And the point, again, for people who are outside of it, the H-2A worker system, the thing that you need to recognize is that those individuals, yes, have legal documentation to be in the United States, but that documentation is held by the grower owner operator, not by the individual. And so therefore, they're essentially a, 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 an indentured servant to that individual. And if that individual doesn't want them anymore, he can send them back at any given time or she can send them back at any given time. So great points, Linda. Thanks for bringing them up. Nice talk. I was particularly interested in your slide showing individuals working. And this uh, first comment actually works well because it carries on to a very good point made uh, earlier. And then, as we know from the work of Chris Gordon at EPA, that as you increase skin blood flow, you're going to increase absorption of a variety of, I would assume, the pesticide mm -hmm. to be with that. So, you do have that problem that if you put more protective clothing in, you increase heat stress. But it seems to me the logical approach would be that there are uh, optical skin protectants that have been developed. Uh, have they looked? Have they thought about the possibility of doing an intervention study with topical skin protectants? So that's my first point. Okay. And then the second point is is that um, looking at the type of work, you have to remember many of these things we heard earlier about approaches for physiological monitoring are really based on dynamic work. And when you look at these tasks, they're combined isometric, dynamic type tasks, much different physiology. And so it, it, I saw earlier physiological strain index. When you start doing things like PSI and that, you can see from the type of work these are going to have no application to the population. So just those two points. Well, I really, I'm going to take those in, in uh, reverse order. I really appreciate you bringing that up because, again, that's, this is completely out of my wheelhouse. I don't know anything about that kind of stuff. And I was trying to ask Tom some of those questions just last night. And as is always the case when you're trying to speak across disciplines, right, it's like you don't even know how to ask the question that you're really trying to get at. And what you've just articulated is exactly the point that I was trying to raise in a very inarticulate way with Tom and David, one of his students that's here. Because again, I, I, I don't know, you know, I'm, I'm new to this heat-related illness kind of thing. I've done farm worker stuff now for almost 20 some odd years, but at least the heat-related illness stuff, I don't know. Um, I, and, and so the idea of, well, how well do those models work for this occupation? No, no earthly ideas, really. Um, you know, and, and even some of the stuff where we've tried to do the long-term monitoring, where they come in, we put on the, 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 the chest strap, we put on the different elements, but then some get on a bus and they don't start working for an hour. Others walk out onto the field and they start working immediately. How do you make sense of the beginning and the end of a work day um, and then having the very different kinds of uh, tasks and activities that are going on? So, so there's a lot of complexity that's built into it, not to mention the physiology that you just talked about. Um, with regard to the topicals, well, frankly, I, I mean, I presume the topicals you're referring to are those for pesticides? Uh, there's, been, there's been topical skin protectants developed by DOD for other types of chemicals, and uh, they've gone through FDA, and uh, there's been heat studies done, because we've done those, and um, I think that they're a good way to look for an intervention study, and I can think broadly about how that would be set up, but yeah, I think that's another approach, because uh -huh. you can keep piling equipment on these people forever. <laughs> But um, you might solve one problem and then you create another. Again, I appreciate you bringing that up because, frankly, I, I, when, I was, when I was looking through the literature, I didn't see those kinds of things, so I'll look forward to talking to you afterwards. That'll be great. Are there any other questions from folks? Bueller? Bueller. Only people in this audience would get that. 
when I do it with the students, they look at me like, huh? All right, well, thanks so much.